for Health Informatics. Uh, so I'm presenting today on behalf of a broader team, uh, most of whom are also based at UCL, but a couple who aren't. Um, and so I'm going to be talking about our work looking at the evaluation of antithrombotic use and COVID-19 outcomes. I'm going to talk through some of our interim results from the English TRE. So quick recap on why we're doing this. Um, so over the last decade, um, there's a class of drugs known as antithrombotics, um, which for individuals with atrial fibrillation, it's a regular heartbeat, um, who are at higher risk of stroke, um, particular class of these drugs, so oral anticoagulants, when they're given are um, significantly reduced risk of stroke. You can see that in the chart on the left, which is a positive, um, but unfortunately there's still a significant minority of people um, who aren't on these medications. Um, and so we sort of want to understand um, why that's the case. Also then, of course, in the last um, 18 months when the COVID-19 pandemic, which has introduced another risk factor, particularly for the, these group of individuals. And there's been some um, observational evidence internationally um, that antithrombotics, particularly anticoagulants, might offer some protection um, against COVID-19 outcomes such as hospitalisation and death. So there are kind of three objectives to this work. Um, the first was actually just making sure we've got an up-to-date comprehensive estimate of how many of these individuals with atrial fibrillation aren't on um, antithrombotics and different classes of antithrombotics and building that in a way that we can reproduce it, you know, in six months time, two years time, five years time. And the second was then to look at kind of the why. So for those that aren't um, on antithrombotics, what are the factors associated with that? And then lastly, looking at the COVID-19 outcomes question and really trying to robustly determine um, whether if you've been taking antithrombotics prior to a COVID-19 event, whether that reduces um, COVID-19 specific hospitalisation and mortality. So it's just a slightly more detailed overview of kind of how we've addressed those objectives. Um, on the left hand side, you can see a summary of the inclusion criteria. Um, you know, based off um, primary care, make sure you're registered, it's adults, it's got to be alive on January the 1st, make sure we've got consistent um, demographic data across the analyses. Um, and importantly, they got the CHADSFAST score um, greater than or equal to two in the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. And for those not familiar with the CHADSFAST score, it's kind of a summary of how that is compiled on the bottom left with the relevant points and brackets. F for the estimates as part of the first objective, um, we covered that across four part time points from January 2020 to May 2021 to try and capture any changes across um, the pandemic. For the second objective, then looking at factor associations, we took the same cohort across, so no additional inclusion criteria, um, and then looked at antithrombotics versus no antithrombotics and then subgroups, so anticoagulants versus antiplatelets and DOACs versus um, warfarin. For them, the COVID-19 outcomes, we looked at people who had any kind of COVID-19 event, so that could be um, a positive test, recorded diagnosis, or, or through to um, COVID-19 death on a death certificate. Um, and we looked at just um, hospitalisation and mortality um, and control for kind of a long list of covariates, which we can go into detail on slightly later. So this is just a quick overview of kind of the cohort that we ended up from applying that. And just to highlight here, so for the first two objectives, because of kind of the breadth of this data set, when it was just under a million individuals who had atrial fibrillation and a chance of score greater than or equals two, you can see even for the subgroup of medications, you still get really well-powered cohorts. And then for the COVID-19 um, event grouping, uh, it's about 8% of that group, so 77,000. So then looking at some of the results now, and so first looking at these estimates of antithrombotic coverage, um, a quick thing to flag up front, um, which might be actually interesting for other people doing analysis in the consortium. So you, you see the total individuals with AF and Chesra score um, over two did rise by kind of monetary by around percent, um, but actually the background um, population data, so even just those registered with RET, went up by about 5%. So some artifact here in the data that was kind of still exploring. So we're not inferring too much from this top line figure. However, when we look at the, the subgroups of different um, antithrombotic classes, um, we see the kind of those middle two blocks. That's what will be described as not optimal according to broadly international guidance. So antiplatelets only, um, slightly lighter blue, and then no antithrombotics at all, um, slightly dark. And, and you can see that the um, number of individuals on no antithrombotics is, is still around 12%. So compared to the, one of the most recent evaluations um, in the UK, um, this kind of marginally improved, but it seems to be a 
that kind of a sort of solid base there that's, that's harder to penetrate. Then on the antiplatelet it's only grouping, um, you can see that actually that's improved quite a bit since the last evaluation. Um, so that, that is positive. We then looked at um, actually individual drug classes. So with the previous slide, they were mutually exclusive groups. So you had to be in one way, so this, this, this could capture an uh, individual could be on say warfarin and aspirin. But it's still interesting to see kind of a clear trend from um, warfarin prescriptions falling across a period, whereas DOAX rose. And this is kind of a direct result of uh, guidance was given at the start of the pandemic because warfarin requires um, in-person monitoring. And so for obvious reasons, there, there was a shift to try and move away that. And it kind of shows how um, you can track uh, and then feed the data back into helping making these kind of rapid um, nationwide medication policy decisions. And then now looking at some of the factors associated with, with a lack of anthropotic use. So on the left hand side, you can see kind of the, the pre-selected factors that we tested, and these came from previous evaluations. Um, the subgroups, there's a shiny app where you can see a lot more detail of the different stratifications, but here we're just looking at um, any antithrombotic versus no antithrombotic. And kind of as you'd expect on the first block um, of comorbidities, um, the comorbidities that make up the chance of our score, um, they do increase the, the odds of being on antithrobotics, which is what you'd expect, and particularly with vascular disease and stroke. And then conversely, um, comorbidities that are signaling future bleeding risks, so that basically make up has bled score, um, like liver disease, they, they lower the risk, and, and that does broadly follow clinical guidance. Um, perhaps a more interesting finding here is around history of fall. So there is a fair amount of literature on this showing that historically history of fall has been used as a, as a signal for assessing bleeding risk. Um, but actually perhaps the risk of stroke in this group is higher than that of bleeding risk. And perhaps there is a, a subgroup here that would benefit from being antithrombotics that, that aren't. Looking then at demographics, because the second block down. So, so it, the results observed here that the women have lower odds of antithrombotic use. Actually, this is likely a result of the Chadwell scoring mechanism um, where uh, women get a point and, and men get zero. Um, so typically they'd be, be a healthier group and less likely to be on antithrombotics. We do, however, then see differences um, across ethnicity, socioeconomic status and geographic location, where broadly you know, individuals who are not of white ethnicity um, and of lower socioeconomic position have lower odds of anthropotic use. And that, you know, ties into to broader systematic health inequalities that, that we see elsewhere. So, so now lastly, looking at then some of the, the COVID-19 outcome results of the third objective. Um, Worth staying here, so, so we used um, multivariable uh, logistic regression, uh, but also Cox regression, and I'll show the sensitivity results for that next. And in the multivariable regression, so this is kind of a binary event outcome, uh, we did adjust for a propensity score for taking, uh, taking antithrombotics. Uh, and we also uh, tried to control for, for the list of covariates um, at the bottom of this slide um, but but accepting you know that there, there are inevitably residual confounding that's very hard to, to control for here um give a sense of the numbers so again we picked up before the 77,000 around 77,000 people in this cohort about half of whom were hospitalized and about a quarter um who sadly died um and what we see from looking at this is um there just seems to be some modest protection um for those who are on um antithrombotics from death, but not of hospitalization, um, which is perhaps slightly counterintuitive, but there are possibly a couple of explanations for this. So, so one could be that if you're on an antithrombotic, you actually already have higher health seeking behavior, um, or you're more likely to be interacting with the health service anyway. Um, so that could be a behavior driven one. And, and an alternative explanation would be actually the protective effect of um, antithrombotics might only kick in at the most severe end. So you'll still get ill enough to go to hospital. Um, it might protect you from death. Uh, and, we, and we saw the same pattern um, in anticoagulants versus um, antiplatelets, uh, but, but not in DOAX versus warfarin, um, where there was no difference in, in mortality, uh, but there were some reduced um, odds of uh, hospitalization, uh, which, which, is, which is positive given that shift we saw earlier from warfarin to DOAX. So as I mentioned, um, we ran multiple regression analyses and time periods to check for concordance. Um, so this is now showing hazard ratios from time to event Cox regression. Um, again, you see the patterns are very similar. We also looked at an, uh, just an earlier time period 
Um, we did we did have vaccine status um, control for in these analysis, but we want to look at covered earlier sub sub segment of the wave anyway. Uh, and as you can see, um, both the the pattern and the effect sizes are broadly similar, which suggests concordance. So in terms of kind of what next, so, so as I mentioned, these, these are interim results. We're, we're still drafting the, the manuscript now um, and we kind of welcome input from the consortium, which we've already had lots of, which is great. Um, and hopefully if I have an efficient week, I'll get that around to um, the consortium this week for some, some wider input. We do want to try and try and replicate this in, in Wales and Scotland. We've had some initial conversations and there are a couple of challenges here. Um, we want to try and work through, but it'd be great to be able to do that. Um, and then, yeah, this is just kind of very much a first step to getting to some more personalised risk predictions for how you could um, inform medicating decisions in these individuals, so particularly how you can then build more personalised stroke and bleeding risk predictions so we can kind of capture that um, coverage a bit better. So anyway, I'll, I'll pause there um, and yeah, 